my face, lady. Why are you looking at me like a crazy person? It's my I know what it looks like, but I'm not having a meltdown. We're being taught the right way to protest. You know what? When you link up like this, it is impossible to move you all. And it's not just about sitting, says the woman who wrote the book on activism. We um, smuggled 10,000 crickets into police headquarters. In East New York, they like to party like it's 1999, before gentrification hit the neighborhood. This is Chris. He likes it right where he is. I want to keep this for my, my generation. In his backyard, he throws parties with a purpose, so he and his friends can keep the developers at bay. Weinstein, Cosby, O'Reilly, Spacey? You'd think sexual assault was invented by celebrities, but no. You have millions and millions of people who have disclosed their experience with sexual violence. For a decade now, Tarana Burke has been fighting back. Though the first time someone asked her to help, she wasn't ready. She had found out the courage to be vulnerable, and I couldn't find the courage to at least say, me too. This week, we're getting ready to resist. rule the internet, professional athletes turn sidelines into political staging grounds, and a tweet can prompt thousands across the country to converge on airports, there's something about a good old environmental protest that seems downright nostalgic. But one look around this action staged by 350.org to mark the fifth anniversary of Hurricane Sandy and the lack of progress made since the devastating storm will disabuse you of any notion of the crunchy Birkenstock set waving Save the Whales banners. Though I do suspect these demonstrators have lots of love for life under the sea. They're even more passionate about helping under-resourced communities keep their heads above water, literally. With an oppositional administration occupying the White House, it's hard to keep up with just what it means to be an activist. Is putting your body on the line under the threat of violence or detention the gold standard? Is it sharing a deeply personal dispatch about the time your privilege inoculated you against injustice or your sex damned you to abuse? Is it creating a two-word hashtag that simultaneously encapsulates a world of hate and a hope of survival? I'd venture to say yeah, yes to all of the above because the essence of resistance is using everything you've got, no matter how powerful or powerless you feel, in the service of the collective good. And despite all the forces working to divide us, the long thread of resistance runs from the shores of Plymouth to the descendants of America's First Nations in Standing Rock. From Harriet working underground to Lily Ledbetter and Beyonce saying F you, pay me, to the nameless, faceless people who suck it up and make their way in the world not made for them every single day. The work ain't easy, but it certainly is necessary. So let's honor them by moving forward. If we can overcome the twin forces of our collective ADD and short historical memory to mark five years post Sandy, that very same fire can burn hot enough to forge change we can believe in, to bring power to the people in whose streets? Our streets. Because to truly make America great again, for our bodies, our rights, we must never forget. The people united will never be defeated. So let's go in on resistance. Get out of no! my face! 
you want to get my dog? You want to get my dog? I want to get my dog. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. Lisa Fithian has been called the dean of resistance training, a reputation earned over nearly four decades of protest that have included more arrests than she can remember and more students than she can count. Today, we add five more to that last column. All right, I want you to do that again. Okay. Ready? Go. I can kick my dog any time I want to kick my dog. Get out of my face, lady. Why are you looking at me like a crazy person? It's my right to be here and do whatever I want to do. What's wrong with you? Why are you looking at me? Say something. Get out of my way. You ready to see this crazy lady? What are you doing? Let me ask you, was it harder for it's you to maintain to that if I'm not? Who's calm. Right, exactly. Yeah. And so part of what we learn is it like if, if, if you're escalating and I escalate, we're going to go like this. But if I come down, yeah. you're not going to be able to sustain it. No. Now you're pretty good at that, but well, you know, so. I have a lot of rage. All right, there you go. <laughs> part of one of the things that we learn when we're engaging people in such, such, such situations of conflict is that there's a variety of strategies we can use to kind of either, it's either going to piss people off more or bring them down. How we look at them, how we hold our bodies, all make a difference. Yes, one person can change the world, but when you and I link up, there's a whole other thing that goes on. Why like, I got interested in looking at direct action is because it works. L.A. Kaufman adds theory and context to the practice of direct action. She's a strategist, journalist, and disruptor who spent 30 years immersed in radical movements some of which is chronicled in her new book, Direct Action, Protest, and the Reinvention of American Radicalism. Movements are driven by their more radical edge, right? It's the people who have the boldest vision and the most sweeping vision of change and who are tactically the boldest, who often kind of push things forward. They're rarely the people who work out the final deal. I was very involved in the fight around um, New York City's community gardens in the late 90s and um, we used all kinds of intense direct action to ultimately win that fight, uh, including most famously we um, smuggled 10,000 crickets into police headquarters and disrupted a real estate auction, a city land auction where they were selling off community gardens by releasing all of these crickets. The next auction we were threatening even worse. Uh, they canceled it at the 11th hour and made a deal that saved all the gardens. It was the land trusts and the elected officials, and that was fine. Like some, you know, sometimes the way that these these Both struggles your play out. Work, they say, right, sometimes even if they're not at the table, this is what happens when you don't listen to the people we're aligned with. Exactly, listen to us, or you've got the cricket people coming after <laughs> you, right? Whatever your goal is, whatever it is you're trying to accomplish, you first, of course, want to identify who can make the change that you want to see. So who are your targets? And then you want to look at what are the pillars of support behind them. And you want to think about how you can target those pillars of support to leave them isolated so that the most sensible decision for them to make is to do what you want them to do instead of what they were planning to do. I mean, this is the classic theory of, of nonviolent resistance that Dr. King and many others um, developed. The advice that I give to people who are looking how to get involved is twofold. One is, is essentially to find your lane, to find a specific issue. You might decide you're going to work on immigrant rights, or you might decide that you're going to work on disability access. And the second part is to be willing to be mobilized. There are all these groups who are facing these moments of crisis and what they need are bodies and supporters. They say, we need you to show up at JFK airport now. Or they say, we need you to come down to the federal building. When, when people put out these alerts, really do it, really commit. Before you commit, it's good to know just what you may be up against. Okay, so we're gonna go into our final role play of blocking this prison. Part of what we're trying to do here is expose the violence of the police, but mitigate the harm on our bodies, right? Because when people see what the police are willing to do, it begins to change their hearts and minds. Yeah. Hear our voices, yeah. hear our yeah. Shut yeah. this yeah. dirty yeah. prison yeah. down. Yeah. Come here, yeah. 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 our voices, yeah. hear our sound. Shut this dirty prison down. Right here. You know what? When you link up like this, it is impossible to move you all. For the police, if they can't get you, they're going to escalate. If I have a baton and I'm shoving it through your arm, yeah. 
right? All I have to do is twist it and I can break your arm. If we get you out, I'm gonna take you out. Let's take you out just for the visual. And then slowly, okay, all right, we got one. Let's bring him over here. Okay, now we're gonna put you over here. We got you. Okay, all right, you're gonna sit down on the bus right over there. Right, so you've closed up again. If I can't get the baton in, my only other recourse is pepper spray or pain compliance holds. You guys did awesome, yeah. awesome. Now, now that was not so comfortable though, was it? If you were ever doing a blockade, you would want to be comfortable. Because sometimes the thing about these actions is they let you wait you out and they let you sit. Just relax, you're all fine, whatever. Da 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 da. Okay, we're going. Out, out, out. Right? Out, out, out. See? So, again, in all of this stuff, yes, we're here to get somebody that's doing something bad to change their mind. But we're also here because we're building our relationships with one another. How do you use the fear and the adrenaline that is going through you? Fear is their most powerful tool. Like, courage is the antidote. Acting is the antidote to fear. I was watching the stuff that happened in Spain with the Catalonian people and them inside those schools and watching the brutality of those officers there kicking and like doing horrible things. Do you fight the urge to get up and swing on the officers to protect your friends? Is that a better technique or is like sitting down and sort of linking up? a preventative thing. You can have a diversity of tactics, right? Where some people are engaging in uh, passive resistance and some people are, are actively confronting and fighting. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then uh, they fight you. And then you win. Right. One, two, three, we're going for it. Okay. That's ah. theory and practice in direct action. Lisa has clearly earned her reputation as the Dean of Resistance Training. But are other methods just as effective? A hashtag can bring you awareness and allies, but how does it yield results? One of the interesting things about this moment is that people are like, we're starting a movement. And I'm like, no, you're joining a movement. I believe healing is radical. And Me Too is a movement to, among other things, radicalize the notion of mass healing. As a community, we create a lot of space for fighting and pushing back, but not enough for connecting and healing. I was actually the camp director for a 21st Century Youth Leadership Movement, our summer leadership camps. There was a young girl who had become just my little special. And during Sister to Sister, we would share, young people would share all kind of things, the, the councils would share kind of things. And it was a way for us to bond and connect and just give a free space for the girls to just relax and just be, right? Some of the young people uh, shared their experiences with sexual violence. And she started to share hers, but didn't, didn't share the entire story. And then like the next day following the session, she started following me, just, I need to talk to you, Mr. Ron, I need to talk to you. I knew she wanted to share that part of her story with me. Um, but at the time in my life, I was 22, um, and I just, I had not really dealt with processing my own pain and my own experience with sexual violence. And I was still just finding language to describe what happened to me, um, and I could not hold space for her. I could not find what I needed, what she needed. Um, in the moment, I just saw the pain in her face. And you know, I was the little tough girl, and I was the one who got in trouble a lot, and I was the one who had a smart mouth and, and those kind of things. And so watching her, knowing that that's the reason where that came from, and watching her close back up, literally before my eyes, like. She had, she had found a, the courage to be vulnerable, and I couldn't find the courage to at least say, me too. Me too is a conversation between survivors, but those are survivors who are ready to say it. Me too, and the, the idea behind me too, and the idea of empowerment through empathy are just entry points into the healing journey. What that journey looks like is completely defined by the individual. If you're ready, there is the onus on survivors to reach back and create space for other survivors to, to come along.
Hashtag resistance is interesting, right? It's a new phenomenon. In a lot of ways, it is such a powerful tool. It is a way that we can connect multiple communities across multiple cities and multiple countries in an instant. For hashtag resistance to be effective, it has to have a component of it that comes off of the computer and into the streets. Um, other than that, it's just advocacy. We have, you know, 12 million engagements with this or more than that across social media which means that you have millions and millions of people who have disclosed their experience with sexual violence. Something has to happen. There has to be some container to process that. Um, there has to be some tools that we put out that help people think about what that means, what happens next in their own lives. Um, and the other thing is we need to reshape the conversation in some ways or expand the conversation beyond individuals, right? It's, Harvey Weinstein, it's Bill Cosby, it's Bill O'Reilly, and it's all these like big bad men who did these big bad things, as opposed to the systems that are in place that allow sexual violence to flourish. Like we have to have conversations about what dismantling those systems look like, and beyond conversations, there needs to be community action in place to help start interrupting and dismantling those systems. That's my work. Historically in movements, um, there's been a dichotomy between white women and women of color. I've said many times that sexual violence knows no race or class or gender, um, but the response to sexual violence does. We know that black women are not believed, right? We know that black women have been highly sexualized in both pop culture, politically, uh, from welfare queens to thoughts. Like there's just a, a, a running theme of, of black women being sexual, hypersexual beings. Um, and we also know historically that black women haven't been protected in the mainstream when it comes to sexual violence. And I think about Harvey Weinstein singling out Lupita as the only person to push back against their narrative around his sexual harassment. It's in line with what we know about black women's experiences. I think about Leslie Jones who was attacked on social media and threatened on social media in hor horrific ways and how there was not a groundswell of support for her from across the board, from white women in America. And I think about R. Kelly and how he's still allowed to thrive in the music industry after terrorizing, victimizing, uh, dehumanizing black girls for more than 20 years. Mark Anthony Neal said this in, in an article, if any one of his victims had been a white girl, just one, it would be a whole different conversation. As we continue to do this work, people on both sides will see that every single voice for an issue like this is extremely important. If Tirana wants us to come off the page and into the community in order to fully resist, what does that even look like? These young men from East New York are giving us a vision of resistance with a party for a purpose. Yo, what up, Why wow, was good? Yo, yo, I just got back the other day, man. How you been? I'm good, brother. It was crazy. We was right up in here and it all went Yo, down. Yo, we was like live, man. It was mad people here. It was packed. Yeah. We had the performances. Drummer right here in the corner. We had the artists singing here. Yo, the band was rocking. It felt good, man. It felt really good. And I think we should continue that movement. Yeah, man. I think it can really change the community. We gotta give them something like, ah, it's not just a party, but we want you to know this is the formula. We got steps you can take. Raise your hand if you know who your council person is in your neighborhood. My child. There you go, that's it. Came out with squads, picking up weeds, garbage bags, and everything to make it a best experience for people. And when they came in, they didn't know how much work we put behind the scenes. They just got to eat food, dance, listen to music. And that shows me they're like hands that serve. 
can be holier than hands that pray. 100% biodegradable, zero waste. These are chefs that Trump is trying to ban. These are from the same countries trying to stop immigration from. It's gonna take a lot of work, but at the end of the day, if we don't do it, someone else is just gonna do the work and then they're gonna wash the people out of there and say, well, you had your opportunity, you didn't do it, so now we're gonna uh, take advantage of your own community. I've been living here since 1982. We moved here, moms and pops, they just wanted to have their own. They was tired of living in an apartment, you know, dealing with the landlords, they wanted their own shit. The problem with gentrification is that I want to keep this for my, my generation, my family, the McFaddens. I want to keep it for them, the future McFadden. All right, man. <laughs> I'm never selling this house. Got the plan set, and we're ready for the fight. We're already ready for the fight. It's already a battle. I got a plan for the house too. To sell the equity, buy another house. Move out this house, yeah. run out this oh, spot, damn. make this into a house. Yeah, somebody oh. gave it to us. Oh, damn. And you know, I don't have no problem y'all coming here. It's just that why can't y'all put culture into community instead of following the corporation rules? The people, the native, the people, they gotta get together. They gotta stop this shit. It could be stopped, it's just that it's, it gotta be unity. You can't be selling out. You know, in the hood, when you come to East New York and see a band playing, you know, in a backyard, you know, like, I feel like just doing that was revolutionary in itself. The purpose is really, to me, I call it artivism, which is, you know, taking that activist mentality, you know, that we learned from the ancestors, Malcolm, and all these heads that really fought in the communities, then art, and then, like, take art and activism and blend it together, because you can't just tell it to people, you gotta create creative spaces. Make some noise for yourselves, you having a good time, that's it. Yeah. We're not the stars of the show, you guys are the stars of the show. Just make sure you get the information, eat as much food as possible, and we out here really to just flip it up for y'all and just have a good time. Communities that were of color, to me, were being displaced. Now I think what happened is that energy became corporatized and it became marketed. It used to be like a lot of Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, Guyanese, Trinidadians, Grenadians, that was the people in Florida to New York in especially 70s and 80s. But now, the black and brown people that made the whole community cool, we built the soul. Like, look at all the movements that came out of New York. They are being moved out. And that's what why that cool stuff that y'all want, that flavor, that, that adobo, that spice, you know, that curry, whatever the hell you call it, it's the funk that oppressed people bring. That flavor is being moved from the city. They do C-SPAN at night when y'all motherfuckers sleeping and changing laws. It's good to vote. Not the president shit, I'm talking about local shit. Go to your town house meetings. Our party for a purpose is, stands out is because it's just like the parties that are going on around here, they're not trying to educate. You know, it's just a party. The miracle is that you're a homeowner staying here and you fighting off, they knocking on your doors trying to pay you out. And, oh, you're, wait. and oh, you're like, nah, so nah, you like, nah, <laughs> nah, you swatting them like flies. I hope that other landlords and other renters get to experience some of this and they get motivation. Because um, a lot of heads they face what you face and they give up. We're not saying they shouldn't bring high-end stuff to the hood, no. Because yeah. a lot of people think when we say stop gentrification, we're like, stop building new stuff. We're like, stop building new stuff for the rich only. I want people to know that, yeah, one person can make a change. And you know what? A small group of people can change the world. Matter of fact, the big changes in this community is made by small groups of people that band together for the same cause. So. Party with a purpose. We're gonna do part two, part three, part four. Part infinity. Exactly. <laughs> part sideways age. <laughs> yeah, doing it, baby. East New York. Thanks for going in with us on Resistance. If you keep fighting the good fight, we'll make sure the revolution is televised right here at the same time next week. And to catch up on previous episodes of Going In, you can always find us at our home online at youtube.com slash bricktv. Bye now.